Never miss a beat with the all-new Money News Market Wrap podcast. It's a snapshot of the day's top market news delivered straight to your device after the closing bell rings. You'll see it all in the Money News podcast feed, so subscribe now and stay up to date on your way home. Thanks to OFX, a better way to move money globally. From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. It's Tuesday, June 13th. The massacre of 28 Aboriginal people in 1838 was the first and only time in Australia when white people were arrested, charged and prosecuted for the mass killing of First Nations people. Those people killed at Mile Creek Station in northern New South Wales were women, children and elderly men known as Weirawai, a tribal clan of the Kamilaroi Nation. But while some publications held the perpetrators to account, our papers did not. 185 years on, the Sydney Morning Herald confronts the brutality of its own coverage of the Mile Creek Massacre and two subsequent trials. Today, editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, Bevan Shields, columnist Peter Fitzsimons, and chief reporter Jordan Baker on attempting to right the wrongs of the past. Bevan, I want to start with you first. We know that the Mile Creek Massacre was just one of many perpetrated by white settlers as they made their way across the country during the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. But it was such a horrific milestone, resulting in the first and only prosecution of colonists for such a crime. So can you tell me, how did the Sydney Morning Herald report on it? Well, the arrests and the two trials that followed the massacre caused a total sensation in the colony and in Sydney. This was really unusual, controversial stuff for the time and of the era. The Sydney Morning Herald then was known as the Sydney Herald, and it hadn't been a decade in publication by then. It was still about six or seven years old. And it really led the charge in the press against the prosecutions and I would say actively campaigned for the 11 uh, accused men to be let off. There was one editorial titled The Blacks which said and I think this was this was really one of the worst it said the whole gang of black animals are not worth the money the colonists will have to pay to print the silly court documents. Now that's extraordinary language now, but it even was at the time. There was another editorial before one of the two trials where the Herald actually said in writing that people should go and shoot Aboriginal people if they felt threatened by them. But it's important to note, while the Herald was raging and campaigning for these guys to be let off, the governor of the day and the attorney general of the day were absolutely insistent on bringing these men to justice. Other newspapers at the time had a much more enlightened view, much more progressive view, much more sympathetic view to the notion that Aboriginal people had the same entitlements under law that British subjects did. And the Herald was really on the edge of that, an outlier to that. And and that's an important point to make when we discuss why we're apologising today. And and a final point is it, it has to be noted that the co-owner and editor of the of the of the Herald at that time was a friend with one of the wealthy landowners who was funding the defense of the 11 accused men. And do you think that solely explains why the Herald was such an outlier and why it was so in opposition to all the other voices that you just spoke about? Uh, look, I don't think it solely explains it. It's an interesting point and I don't think you can ignore it, but I think the truth is that the Herald would have I suspect, been channeling the view of a Mm. lot of people in the colony at the time. That doesn't make it right, though. So how has the coverage of Mile Creek weighed on the paper's conscience, do you think? It's interesting because, I mean, this is 185 years ago. I think it's a really important point to make that the Herald's overall tone and attitude towards Aboriginal people changed quite substantially in the 1840s when John Fairfax took over. That's a really Mm. important point to make. But this has been something that really, when we talk about the Mile Creek story, when you read about the Mile Creek story in depth, when you talk to people from Mile Creek and descendants, and when you talk to historians who have an interest in the media of the time, the Herald's coverage is not just a little footnote in the Mile Creek story. It's a a part Mm. of it. It's a part of it. So 
we've been aware of it, but we felt as though the 185th anniversary, the discussion that's going on across Australia at the moment about reconciliation and what that looks like in 2023, and also I think the sort of the growing awareness in in the curriculum, in dis- in everyday discussion about the frontier wars and exactly what happened. That's really exploded recently. Um, so there's sort of been a collision of various mm. events and forces that I think right. make this the right time to actually issue the apology. Right. Okay. And so to you, Peter, because I know this is a mm. subject you're incredibly passionate about, and you've just written some 5,000 words printed on the weekend about what exactly happened mm. at Mile Creek. So why do you believe an apology is so vital right now, you know, where we're at? I love the Herald. I've always loved the Herald. I grew up on the Herald. I work at the Herald. I've been here for nigh on 40 years. And, you know, as I say, in my time, and I think in recent history, we've been on the right side of history. This one is such a standout. Obviously, for me, uh, we can't go back to every editorial position we've had for 193 years. But this one is so egregiously wrong. Now's the right time to say, we got that wrong. Not only did we get it wrong, we got it shockingly wrong. Where, and, and to put it on the same platform, which is an editorial, that it originally appeared. So I think it'll help heal the wound on the paper's soul and heal the wound on the national soul. Right. And so what more should newsrooms across Australia be doing now, do you think? I mean, is an apology from the Sydney Morning Herald and pieces such that you've mentioned reflecting on this traumatic history that we all share, is that enough? Well, that will ultimately be for readers to judge. There's a big movement happening at the moment around mastheads, newspapers that have a long record of publishing, looking back at their history and trying to atone for the moments that did not live up to their reputation. So there's lots of things we can do. We still have more to do. All newsrooms, I think, recognise, including the Herald, our, the diversity of our journalists is not what it should be. We need more a more diverse group of journalists. We need more Indigenous journalists. That's something that we're being very upfront about and have to work on. But I do think that we should not overlook the significance of just saying sorry mm. and we got this wrong. And please, the, to the victims, to the descendants of the victims, please forgive us for that. I think, as in with Kevin Rudd in 2007, that was not an ending, it was a beginning. And yeah. I, think, I think with this, with us saying sorry, it's not. It's it's the beginning. It's part of the healing process, understanding what happened. I think the, for us to properly heal as a nation, we need to understand what happened, what were the wounds, and as I say in my piece, just how deep those wounds went. I completely acknowledge there will be some people who will look at this, read this, listen to our discussion now, who are very sensible people, but will still say at the end of that, mm, I don't know, you know, why Why do you need to do this? Why do you need to apologise for history? Yep. I get that people will feel that way. I guess all I would say is that I, as I argue in the editorial, that I think the capacity to recognise the past wrong says a lot about us now and our future. Newspapers have played a big and important role in society and we should be grown up, we should be the adults in the room, and we should be prepared to say we got this wrong. And the fact that we can recognise that it should give you some confidence about our approach now. And finally now, in this 21st century, third decade of the 21st century, we're starting to understand more and more of what actually happened. And that's and I'd imagine the critics of this might say it's the black armband view of history. It's not. It's to say things happened in our history that are good and bad and v- ugly. And there are things that happen in our history that are fantastic. And there are things that are really seriously ugly. And this one was seriously ugly, but will be better as a nation to know that they happened. Thank you so much, Bevan and Peter, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Chief Reporter for the Sydney Morning Herald, Jordan Baker, on her trip to Mile Creek with Indigenous Elders. Never miss a beat with the all-new Money News Market Wrap podcast. It's a snapshot of the day's top market news delivered straight to your device after the closing bell rings. 
You'll see it all in the Money News podcast feed. So subscribe now and stay up to date on your way home. Thanks to OFX, a better way to move money globally. So Jordan, you travelled to Mile Creek to speak to the community about what happened there. And you met with one woman in particular, an elder of the community. So can you tell me more about that trip and about the woman you spoke to? So I went up to Mile Creek with our photographer, Rhett Wyman, who is a beautiful photographer. And we met an elder. Her name is Sue Blacklock. Now, she is a descendant of one of the two little boys who were managed to escape the massacre in 1838. She grew up with the story of the Mile Creek massacre, learning it from her elders when she lived in a, a little Aboriginal community at Tinga, which is close to in Burrell. She's in her 80s now. Beautiful woman. So, Rhett and I took Sue out to the memorial one day. Should we cut across here to save you some beautiful, eerie sight? Uh, and she sat down on a rock in the bush and, and told us the story. I closed my eyes, I could hear the children laughing and playing, talking, and the mothers was earlier trying to cook the dinner. They were told about the time many generations ago when women and children were on the Mile Creek Station. The men were out doing some work, uh, taking bark off trees. Bar cutting and other stuff. And in swept a group of stockmen. All of a sudden they heard horses coming and they knew something was wrong. They started to gather their kids. They had they tied them all up, the neck. They marched them. We snatched the babies out of the mother's arms. Buried them up to their necks and they cutting their heads off while they were buried in the sand. A couple of shots were fired, but it was mostly knives. And burnt them. And when the men heard all this commotion, they were watching. There was nothing they could do. And tell me about your ancestor, the boy. They just ran wherever they could find. Never stopped until they hit the mountain. I can't find a word to say. It just hurts so much, you know, because they was my ancestors. They was our family. Yeah, you know, some of them little children that was could have been some of my sisters, some cousins, aunties, uncles. So, Jordan, I understand there was an attempt to keep this story a secret within the community. So can you tell me a bit about that? Why is that? They lived with the fear, you know, the fear of the white man coming through again, you know, and and, and taking their children and, and killing their women. So they lived with this constant fear for about 150 years. And, and there was also a level of anxiety over the allegation that the Aboriginal men were there to steal cattle. I mean, obviously, as we look back now, like even if they had, there's nothing that would justify a bloody massacre like that. But there was this kind of kernel of anxiety and guilt and and shame that they had been accused of stealing, which was mixed into all this other stuff. And it, it, that came up very strongly when I was talking to Sue. Mm. She kept repeating, she was, we, they weren't stealing, they were given meat. They weren't stealing, they were given meat. So there was this long-lasting anxiety about, you know, that somehow they'd brought it on themselves, which is just awful and heartbreaking. God, it's it's impossible to imagine, really. And and it was Sue's idea, is that right, for a permanent memorial stone to be erected at the site? So the elders were asked and they said, we just want a really big stone that can't be moved mm. to permanently commemorate what happened here. The memorial, it overlooks a plane in which, you know, the, the massacre happened, but we don't know exactly where because that's, a, that's, you know, very sort of private information for the local people. But it's incredibly moving. It's silent. Uh, mm. It's beautiful. Mm. You know, you, you, you walk down this rainbow serpent path to the memorial itself and there's plaques along it which describe what happened 
and you know your, your feet sort of crunch on the gravel, but that's the only sound you can really hear. It's 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 eerie. It's peaceful, and it's yeah, it's very moving. And what does it? What's the significance for the community that there is that memorial? So for the Aboriginal community, it is a, a, a vindication. At last, you know, it's the end of this gaslighting. It's an admission and a, an acknowledgement that this did happen to their ancestors and this was a horrific thing to happen to their ancestors and it should never it have rained. happened. It rained every year after we first started. Every year it rained, poured and poured. We just believed that it was the ancestors' cry of relief. Tears of relief and knowing that we was in tears of joy knowing that they was remembered, that somebody remembered them and never forgot them. And to release their spirits. The Mile Creek Memorial site is often visited also by the sense of the perpetrators. So Beulah Adams, for example, is one of the people we spoke to and she can trace her lineage back to one of the stockmen who was hanged for the crime. So for, for people like her to come along, and there's another chap called Des Blake is also a descendant of one of the perpetrators, for them to also come along and for them to say, you know, we're, we are so sorry about what happened is kind of a, a sort of a beautiful acknowledgement, really facing up to what happened into the in the past, acknowledging what happened in the past, acknowledging the pain that the community has been through ever since. It's a really lovely example of reconciliation and the fact that these people are coming together is, has really helped the local town of, of Inverell also mend a lot of bridges. I mean, this is, you know, these are parts of rural New South Wales where there were deep divisions for a long time. There have been long and deep divisions in this part of the world. Moree, which isn't far, is notorious for its racial segregation. But what's happening in Inverell now at the moment is you have some really great Aboriginal studies teachers that Kids who go to Inverell High often choose Aboriginal studies. A lot of the non-Aboriginal kids choose it. There's more non-Aboriginal kids in those classes than Aboriginal kids. When they have these lessons from these extraordinary Aboriginal studies teachers and when Sue Blacklock and Beulah Adams both come in and talk about what happened with their ancestors together, you have these kids who are really learning living history in a way and they're going home and they're challenging some of the, you know, quite old-fashioned views of their grandparents, for example, and this reconciliation is kind of running through the whole community and it's, it's, it's really powerful. I mean, it's inspiring and so profound, isn't it? And it makes me wonder about, you know, how the rest of us are going with this, you know, outside of those communities. I mean, do you think we're making any progress in regards to educating the next generations on the frontier wars in Australia's dark past, you know, beyond these communities that have been so directly affected? Oh, that's a very interesting question because, I mean, I went to school in Australia in the 80s and 90s and we did not learn anything about this. You know, Mile Creek, while it was incredibly well documented at the time, was documented in newspapers, in court reports, in government, you know, government dispatches, it was then just forgotten. And it was sort of rediscovered in the 1960s by an historian. But even then, it took about 20 more years for it to even sort of seep into the wider consciousness. This is one of the tricky things about history, right? Like, especially recent history, it's very emotional because there's a living memory and there are living stories that are being handed down. And it's very difficult to look at your own past and go, is, is this the sort of country we are? Is, is this what our country was built on? There is a sense of stillness, isn't there? I feel like peace. Knowing that the truth is out there. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carr Katzel. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. 
I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening. Never miss a beat with the all new Money News Market Wrap podcast. It's a snapshot of the day's top market news delivered straight to your device after the closing bell rings. You'll see it all in the Money News podcast feed, so subscribe now and stay up to date on your way home. Thanks to OFX, a better way to move money globally.